Well, hi everyone. Um, I am back to reviewing chapter nine of Richard Balcom's book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. This is my third, I think it's my third uh, uh, video on chapter nine and I should be able to finish it with this, uh, with this video. I'm going to apologize up front. This uh, organizing the material that I need to discuss uh, in the rest of chapter nine um, it was difficult to organize in a way uh, that is presentable. And so I'm going to apologize up front. This may be a little bit confusing. If it is, please let me know. I'll try and reorganize it again. Um, but uh, imagine me trying to read uh, chapter. This is a very confusing chapter for me for reasons I'll get into here in a little bit. Uh, but so with, with that apology aside, just stick with me uh, if you if you can. <laughs> so the last time, uh, well, let's see. Well, the last time I talked about uh, what uh, Papias had to say about the evangelist Mark and what we assume to be the gospel of Mark. And last time I talked about um, some Greek words that Richard Balcom translated in a way that kind of raised some red flags to me. So I, I discussed that. Um, this time around, we're going to talk mainly about what Papias has to say about the uh, what we assume to be the Gospel of Matthew. Oh, and a sneak, uh, sneak preview, uh, he, Papias is also going to talk about a, another Gospel. Um, that you may not be aware of, uh, but we're gonna. That's gonna be a secret surprise. I'll get to that later. So, let me talk a little bit about what made this chapter, uh, in particular, uh, a little confusing. And it's that in several instances, Richard Balcom talks out of both sides of his mouth. He argues two sides or opposing sides of a position. And you know, I'm really trying to understand to 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 understand what Richard Balcom is arguing for. I truly am trying to understand. I'm taking notes. I'm trying to organize it as best I can. But he kind of waffles back and forth in a way that I'm not sure what he's doing. He does this several times, but it becomes most egregious in this chapter. So here's an example. Here's an example. Um, Let's ask the question, did the evangelist Mark write down everything that he heard from the apostle Peter? Um, well, <laughs> I guess it depends on what page you're reading from Richard Balcom. Sometimes Richard Balcom will argue that, yes, uh, the evangelist Mark did write down everything. And he says this for apologetic reasons. For instance, on page 208, uh, Richard Balcom says that Mark made it his one concern not to omit anything he had heard or to falsify anything. This is a version of the common stock formula by which an author claims to have neither omitted nor added anything. Uh, that's from page 208. And Richard Balcom is saying this because when he interprets, or I should say when he translates Eusebius, who is in turn quoting Papias, Eusebius says himself that the evangelist Mark is writing down everything that Peter says. Here's how Balcom translates uh, Eusebius from page 203. Mark, in his capacity as Peter's interpreter, wrote down accurately as many things as Peter recalled from memory. Okay, that's just a straight translation that Balcom makes uh, of, Euse of Eusebius, and that's a standard translation. You can look up other translations uh, on um, online, or there's some um, there's some open source uh, translations that were done. You know, there, there's plenty of versions of Eusebius out there, and they all more or less say the same thing that Mark translated everything that he heard from Peter. And Richard Balcom is agreeing with this, and he's making the argument that Mark did this because he wants to argue that Papias is, is uh, writing accurate historiography. He's like putting him on a really high pedestal. 
uh, putting him on a huge standard. Why? Because Richard Balcom is writing three or four chapters based on a single paragraph uh, from Papias about what he has to say about the evangelist Mark. So a lot of his argument rests on Papias, and Papias says that Mark wrote down everything by golly. Richard Balcom has to argue vociferously for that position. Okay, great. However, <laughs> however, if you turn to uh, another part of Richard Balcom's book and ask that same question, did Mark write down everything he heard from Peter? Um, the answer is no. <laughs> for instance, on page 172, Richard Balcom says, it is, for example, hardly conceivable that Mark knew no traditions of the sayings of Jesus other than those he includes in his Gospels, which are surprisingly few in the light of his emphasis on Jesus as a teacher. We cannot tell what interesting memories of Peter Mark has left aside in a narrative that is so strongly focused on certain definite concerns. Uh, great, so uh, when the mood strikes, apparently, Mark knew all kinds of stuff that... <laughs> that he left out. Uh, who can guess what it is? And, you know, amazingly enough, Richard Balcom translates the same portion of Eusebius uh, on page 219 like this. Mark wrote down some individual items as Peter related them from memory. Hey, hey, wait a minute, Richard Balcom. On page 203, you translate Eusebius as as uh, wrote down accurately as many things as Peter recalled from memory. Now you're telling me that on page 219, he wrote down just some individual items. Huh? So <laughs> why does Balcom do this? Um, he has an apologetics for this position also. Because Balcom wants to make Papias in his discussion of the Gospels of Mark and Matthew, he wants to make Papias uh, making a contrast with another fuller Gospel. Hmm, I wonder what the Gospel that would be. Well, at any rate, Papias never discusses it, but he's trying to elbow room in there somehow to make Papias talk about another Gospel. So here's what Balcom says on page 219. There must be an implicit contrast with other fuller Gospels. But Papias does not blame Mark for the incompleteness of his compilation, since he did not omit anything he had heard from Peter. Once again, what might otherwise seem a deficiency in Mark is justified by the fact that Mark was doing no more than translate and record Peter's teaching in the form of krei. Um, and if you remember from the last uh, discussion uh, I had, that was uh, krei is Greek for uh, anecdote, basically. So with that aside, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later. Balcom is going to um, shoehorn in the Gospel of John, but this is where it begins. Balcom is trying desperately to figure out a way to get Papias to talk about the Gospel of John. None of the fragments that we have preserved of Papias ever mention the Gospel of John, not even hint at it. Uh, however, you know, Balcom is going to make him talk about it by hook or by crook. And this is how, you know, one step, this is the preparation he's laying, the groundwork he's laying, so that eventually he's going to shoehorn the Gospel of John in. It's, again, an apologetic, but he's arguing out of both sides of his mouth, and I really am trying to understand what Richard Balcom's positions are. I'm trying to pay attention. I'm trying. I'm, I'm taking copious notes as I go, trying to outline everything, and I see these, um, these contradictions in Richard Balcom's arguments. And this is not the only one. He's done this with uh, several other very key items. Um, so anyway, that's what is making this book particularly confusing for me, and it's it, it's difficult for me to uh, therefore discuss 
uh, because I'm, I'm not exactly sure what way he's going and it is contradictory. So with all that said, let's, let's, let's move on. Now, on this slide, I am reproducing what church historian Eusebius quotes a uh, second century apologist Papius as saying, but I'm also including um, uh, comments made by Eusebius uh, himself. So I'm taking this straight from Eusebius. So the way I wrote this um, is, is that I put the entire thing from Eusebius's church history on this slide, but I put the words of Papius in red. So it's a, you know, it's a red letter edition, right? Um, I broke it up into four paragraphs. Uh, the first paragraph, we've gone over a lot so far, uh, and Richard Baucom has talked about this. This is what Papias has to say about what, you know, we assume is the uh, Gospel of Mark, and we've discussed this ad nauseum. Uh, the second paragraph uh, is a uh, interjection by Eusebius himself. Um, the third paragraph is again Papias, and it's what he has to say about what we assume to be uh, the Gospel of Mark, or pardon me, the Gospel of Matthew. Here's what he says Papias says, therefore, Matthew put the Logia in an ordered arrangement in the Hebrew language, but each person interpreted them as best he could. Period. That's it. <laughs> That's all we've got uh, regarding what Papias has to say about what we assume to be the Gospel of Matthew. A couple of interesting things uh, that Richard Baucom is going to bring up, and I'll, I'll discuss in detail uh, a little later. Notice the first word in that sentence is therefore. So between the first and the third paragraphs where, you know, it's a direct quotation from uh, Papias, uh, Eusebius breaks in with his own comment um, and it appears because the third uh, paragraph begins with the word, the sentence begins with the word therefore. It means it, it hints at that there is something missing, that Eusebius has edited something out and, uh, you know, because it was not relevant to what he was, you know, interested in discussing, probably, um, and continued on with what Papias had to say about the Gospel of Matthew. So that leaves open the question, hmm, it looks like there is something missing from Papias, Hmm, what could that be? <laughs> what could that missing thing be? Uh, what did Papias talk about that Eusebius uh, uh, did not include in his church history? Hmm. So uh, a lot of the uh, chapter of uh, Richard Baucom uh, is going to discuss uh, that. Uh, and uh, yeah, I wonder if you can guess what that might be, uh, <laughs> considering the lead up I made to that. The fourth paragraph is again Eusebius, and I included this in the slide because Richard Balcom does not discuss this fourth paragraph at all, which I think is interesting because, uh, let me read it. This is Eusebius. At the same, and the same writer uses testimonies from the first epistle of John and from that of Peter likewise, and he relates another story of a woman who was accused of many sins before the Lord, which is contained in the gospel according to the Hebrews. These things we have thought it necessary to observe in addition to what has uh, already been stated. So Papias, in his writings, which are now lost, apparently also included things from the Epistle of John, uh, something from Peter, and a story of a, uh, a, a woman uh, accused of many sins. Now, just that sentence of that story, uh, this, you know, the story of the woman accused of many sins, 
what story could that be? Well, it sounds like it could be the uh, story of, you know, the woman who was caught in adultery, the uh, religious authorities, you know, took her out in front of Jesus, get ready to stone her, and they interrogate Jesus. What do you have to say about this woman, you know? And, and Jesus, you know, very famous saying, those of you without sin cast the first stone, and they all walk away, and Jesus tells her to sin no more, and a uh, very famous story. Now, last I looked, uh, you know, assuming that's what Eusebius is talking about, um, which it may or may not be, but assuming that is what Eusebius is talking about, that is the story, and he's saying that Papias did tell that story, where does it say that Papias got that story from? Well, the story we know about came from the Gospel according to John. Um, uh, most scholars understand that that is not original to the Gospel of John. I'm not sure when that story entered into the Gospel, but at any rate, um, that's how we, in the 21st century, uh, know that story. It's from the Gospel of John. However, uh, Papias found it in the Gospel according to the Hebrews. Hey, that's really interesting. I think that's, make of it what you will, I think that's very important. It says that Papias knew explicitly <laughs> about something called the Gospel according to the Hebrews, which apparently, from what I understand, is something that was um, related to uh, the gospel according to Matthew. In fact, there were many uh, gospels that were in the Matthean tradition. They were basically variations of the gospel according to Matthew. Uh, doesn't look to me like Papias is bringing up the gospel according to John. He talks about the first epistle of John and what he could have had from Peter. I don't know, but you know, the gospel according to Hebrews, it's explicit. Papias used it. Does Richard Balcom bring that up? Not on your life. Totally ignores this. Never prints this portion of Eusebius at all in his book, at least not through chapter 9. Uh, by golly, he does shoehorn in, in the gospel of John. Uh, <laughs> he's got a crowbar, that thing. in. <laughs> but gospel according to Hebrews, no way. And again, I'll talk about that uh, in a little bit more detail as we go. So um, again, I'll leave a link to the uh, this portion of Eusebius's church history in the description. Uh, look it up for yourself. It's uh, interesting stuff. So um, let's look a little bit in a little bit more detail in what Papias has to say about uh, what we again what we assume to be the uh, Gospel of Matthew. It's it's not. 100% clear that's what he is talking about, uh, but at any rate. Richard Balcom says on page 222, We do not know whether in Papias' report of what the elder said, this sentence uh, followed immediately on the account of Mark's gospel, as Eusebius reproduces it, or whether there was intervening material that Eusebius has omitted. The latter seems more probable because the therefore at the beginning of this statement about Matthew seems to presuppose something has been omitted. So, you know, I gave you a sneak preview. We're talking about what Papias says about the Gospel of Matthew. It begins with the word therefore. It seems like a non sequitur. Looks like something has been omitted there, and that and that may be true. Now, if something has been omitted, you know, was it a purposeful omission because Eusebius doesn't agree with something Papias is saying and he wants to suppress it? Or is it omitted just as an editorial decision that, you know, it's intervening material that is not relevant to what Eusebius is, you know, particularly uh, interested in? Um, uh, however, it's not one that Balcom explicitly uh, talks about. And... I think he should because actually the way he argues, the way Balcom, um, the way Balcom wants to fill that gap between what Papias has to say about Mark and what Papias has to say about Matthew, the way he fills that gap is 
it, it kind of depends on Eusebius thinking both things. Uh, it, you know, is it malicious or is it just an editorial decision? For instance, Richard Balcom continues to talk about that gap uh, with it just being an editorial decision. Listen to what he has to say, uh, continuing on page 222. Uh, that would make this earliest of all accounts of the origins of the Gospels a witness to Markan priority over Matthew. But it seems more likely that Eusebius has omitted some material, perhaps to the effect that Matthew, unlike Mark, was a personal disciple of Jesus. Eusebius may have thought this obvious and therefore redundant. Okay, that's from Richard Balcom, page 200 and, uh, 222. So right there, Richard Balcom is, um, is trying to shoehorn uh, discussions about uh, our Gospels uh, into that gap. Uh, I'll call it the Papias Gap. Why not? <laughs> the Papias Gap. Uh, uh, sounds like a, uh, a uh, procedure my wife has to do uh, occasionally. But at, at, at any rate, that's what I'll, I'll call it for, uh, for clarity. Um, so the Papias, you know, assuming that there's material edited out by Eusebius, uh, Eusebius begins to speculate what was in that gap. What was Papias talking about? Well, the first thing he brings up is that, um, you know, maybe he was talking what, what seems more likely. In fact, he, he says this is likely, um, was th that Papias was talking about um, uh, that Matthew was a disciple of Jesus, but Eusebius decided to leave it out because, well, you know, it's just obvious, you know, so we can just edit that material out. You know, that, that's pretty interesting. I mean, I, I don't mind speculation like that. It's, however, once again, you know, Balcom is, is assigning probabilities to it that he's saying it is a, uh, a likely position that this is what Papias is discussing, the fact that, hey, Matthew is a eyewitness, uh, you know, of these events. Well, I don't know how you assign probabilities, you know, what's more likely than anything else. You know, I don't mind, again, I don't mind speculation of what, about what could have been in that gap, but it's speculation. Uh, you know, anything goes. Um, put something in there. What if, if Papias was talking about something, put it in there, try it out, see if it works, but it it, it seems to me it's equally likely that Papias could have been talking about, you know, anything. Maybe the enchiladas he had for lunch. I, I you know, I don't know what he was talking about. If, if that is, in fact, a, a legitimate gap that was edited out, which from here on, let's assume it is. Um, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't mind that Balcom is assuming, but he's really trying hard to shoehorn in discussions uh, about our Gospels for apologetic reasons. But let me tell you what is, in my opinion, much more egregious in, in, this, sent, in this paragraph from Richard Balcom. The fact that um, uh, it must include a, a discussion about Matthew, but it was edited out because, hey, everybody knows that Matthew is an eyewitness. And, and here, here, here's what I find so bothersome about that. Richard Balcom has spent, um, I should have counted him up, but he spent the bulk so far between chapters one and nine, he has spent the bulk of the, uh, the argumentation establishing that the gospel of Mark is based on eyewitness testimony. He's got the frequency of names in the gospel of Mark whole chapter to that. He's got um, inclusio devices in the Gospel of Mark, a whole chapter devoted to that. He's got the, uh, what is it, the uh, uh, the third to first pro person pronoun switcheroo, you know, <laughs> that proves or whatever uh, that, that Peter was the source of eyewitness uh, testimony in the Gospel of Mark. Um, he's got 
you know the uh, the eyewitness uh, the, the uh, the New Testament eyewitness protection program uh, that's specific to the Gospel of Mark. You know, most of his argumentation has been based on the Gospel of Mark. Some, however, re I think back to these discussions, if you've been with me from the beginning, think back to some of these discussions that I did on, for instance, the Inclusio device. Richard Balcom admits up front that when you apply the same theory of inclusio device that he got from the Gospel of Mark, try applying it to the Gospels of Luke and John, well, he tries it and he can kind of make it work, but it, it's obvious. It's really contrived. And he tries it on the Gospel of Matthew and he says, no, it doesn't fit in the Gospel of Matthew. There's no inclusio device in the Gospel of Matthew. He talks about the frequency of names uh, in the Gospel of Mark and how it fits secular but contemporary uh, sources, um, how it fits the frequency of names in, in those writings. I, you know, I, I did a whole video on that. I discussed how ridiculous I think that argument is. However, that is his argument. And when he, when he applies the model that he builds based on those frequency of names, he comes right out and says it does not work with the Gospel of Matthew. Um, here's what he has to say. Let's see. On page 112, uh, talking about the frequency of names, Richard Balcom says that um, the author of Matthew's Gospel intended to associate the gospel with the apostle Matthew, but was not himself the apostle Matthew. Richard Balcom says this on page 112. He says that the, the, um, the author of the gospel of Matthew, based on his model of frequency of names, cannot be the apostle Matthew. That's how he ends the, the, the chapter, way back on page 112. Now, he never brings it up again. And I said way back in my discussion of that chapter on frequency of names, uh, I can't remember what chapter it is, but at any rate, I said way back then, I don't think a lot of people are going to be happy with this. I mean, I think it's going to cause problems. I can't imagine any Christian reading this book, any at least fundamentalist reading this book, is going to be happy <laughs> reading this paragraph that says that the Apostle Matthew cannot have been the author of the gospel named after Matthew. Uh, and he says it cannot be based on the models that Richard Balcom built out of the frequency of names. So far in this book, the gospel of Matthew has been the oddball. It's been the, uh, it's been the, uh, the, 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 uh, the black sheep. It's been the exception to all of these, uh, these uh, rules that, that Richard Balcom has been establishing. Uh, so far, the Gospel of Matthew hasn't really fit any of them. Balcom acknowledges it and moves on. All of a sudden, in chapter 9, after laying all of this argumentation for the authorship and the eyewitness testimony of the Gospel of Mark and ignoring the Gospel of Matthew, or showing that the Gospel of Matthew does not fit any of those models, all of a sudden, without you even noticing, the Gospel of Matthew is based on eyewitness testimony. With no argumentation. With, n with nothing. Richard Balcom just pulls this out. Search through chapters 1 through 9 of Jesus and the eyewitnesses. You will find no discussion about the uh, eyewitness testimony of the Gospel of Matthew. You won't find it. And as I said, as a matter of fact, Richard Balcom admits that the author cannot have been the Apostle Matthew. So he ignores it. And then but while you're not looking, hey, huh, the Gospel of Matthew is based on eyewitness testimony from, from out of thin air. It comes out of thin air. 
unbelievable unbelievable this this is a huge red flag and then from here on he's going to talk about the eyewitness testimony of the gospel of matthew he's going to he's going to run with this through the rest of chapter 9 i think that that is the most uh, i'm not quite sure what to call it but um i'm going to call it the lo- the the biggest flaw in this book so far and there's been quite a few big ones but this by far is the biggest flaw in this book um without you even looking all of a sudden richard balcom says that uh just asserts that matthew is based on eyewitness testimony and that the god that the uh event that the uh apostle matthew is the author of the gospel of matthew and that everybody knew it based on no evidence no arguments nothing he just does it when you're not looking. Absolutely incredible. Okay. Uh, enough of that. Um, sorry for getting so worked up. Anyway, let's talk some more about um, what Richard Balcom has to say about the Gospel of Matthew based on Papias. This is, I found, kind of interesting. Check this out. Uh, Richard Balcom says on page 224, he wants to talk about what... Papias knew about um, the Gospel of Matthew. And this is another one of these instances where, you know, Balcom is going to be talking out of both sides of his mouth. He makes a big deal about the order of, of, of how things were ordered by the, by the evangelist Mark and by the evangelist Matthew. I talked quite a bit about that in the last uh, video. How, again, Balcom talked out of both sides of his mouth regarding uh you know the ordering of material so check that out if you want but here's what balcom infers about what the evangelist matthew thought of the ordering of his written material check this out apparently papias thought that there had been more than one translation of matthew's original work into greek he probably knew something about the Greek Gospels bearing the name of Matthew and related to our canonical gospel, uh, uh, related to our canonical Matthew. And uh, the examples Balcom uh, gives are the Gospel of the Nazarenes and the Gospel of the Abionites, which were used by Jewish Christians in Palestine and Syria. He knew they exhibited major divergencies from the Gospel of Matthew used in his home church in Hierapolis and neighboring churches. Well, I thought that interesting. Let, let's go back to what Papias actually has to say about the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, Papias says, Therefore Matthew put the Logia in an ordered arrangement in the Hebrew language, but each person interpreted them as best he could so you know that's one lousy sentence uh, so you know it's pretty you know it's pretty uh, self-evident in my opinion what it means you know Matthew whoever this Matthew is put the logia however you want to translate that <laughs> in an ordered arrangement in the Hebrew language but each person interpreted them as best he could. Okay, a couple problems here. Um, If we're going to make this talk about our present day Gospel of Matthew. Um, For one, logia uh, in Greek means the sayings. Uh, So the Gospel of Matthew doesn't quite fit that description. But again, we talked about this last time. Uh, Richard Balcom helpfully translates Logia not as sayings, but as sayings and deeds. Uh, so, you know, that, <laughs> wow, <laughs> that covers uh, that base. Um, but he put them in an ordered arrangement um, and in the Hebrew language. Now, this is something that Richard Balcom's going to have trouble with because we know that uh, our Gospel of Matthew, I think, was written uh, originally in Greek. And uh, I think we know this because there are certain puns used in that gospel that only that only work in the Greek language. That's my understanding. I don't know if that's really true, but that's one of the evidences that's that's used that it was written in Greek. At any rate, it doesn't. You know, the the, the description given by Papias doesn't exactly fit 
our uh, canonical Gospel of Matthew. So, so what is what is Richard Balcom going to do about this? Well, he says that well, a lot of people, um, he notices that there are a lot of other gospels that are in the you know what I called earlier the Matthean family. They're kind of related to each other, like the Gospel of the Nazarenes, the Gospel of the Abianites. There, I think they're all kind of versions of. Uh, the Gospel of Matthew, or they're based off it, or they're related to it somehow. So, Balcom is saying that that there are a lot of people who got the original um, Gospel of Matthew, which was in Hebrew, and they translated it, and all of those translations are messed up. <laughs> I guess. And all of those translations became what we now presently know as the Gospel of the Nazarenes and the Gospel of the Abianites. A couple of interesting things here. Um, first off, we don't know what version of the Gospel of Matthew Papias was in fact using in his home church in Hierapolis. Um, Balcom just jumps in and says that all of these other gospels, uh, the gospel of the Nazarenes, all of you know, the gospel of the Abianites, they're all inferior translations and were major divergencies from the gospel that Papias had, which just happens to be the uh, canonical, what we know today as the canonical gospel of Matthew. How does Balcom come to this conclusion? We know that there are many gospels in the Matthean family. How does Balcom jump to the conclusion that Papias had the, we'll call it the original version? I, I, I don't know how you can jump to that conclusion. I, I, I thought that was kind of interesting, but check this out. This is something that I found more troubling. Balcom gives as examples two inferior versions of the Gospel of Matthew. He gives as examples the Gospel of the Nazarenes and the Gospel of the Abianites. Can you think of something he may have missed there? Can you think of something he may have missed? Well, it's something that Eusebius uh, explicitly used in the very next paragraph that Balcom did not include in his discussion. And I talked about it earlier. It's the gospel according to the Hebrews. This is a gospel that is also used in the, uh, math, that is part of the Matthean family of, of gospels. It's based on or related to the gospel of Matthew. Um, and Eusebius explicitly mentions this gospel as a source uh, for Papias' work. So let me get this straight, Richard Balcom. You're saying that Papias used the original, uh, uh, the original's a tricky word, I should say the, uh, the correct, or what we know as today, the canonical version of the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew that was written by the Apostle himself, apparently. Um, however, you leave out a discussion that Papias did use also his uh, a, 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 another gospel in the Matthean family called the Gospel According to the Hebrews. You did not discuss that. And you did not use that as, as examples. You just kind of ignored it. <laughs> so I, I just thought that was interesting in that, in that Richard Balcom wants Papias to use the canonical Gospel of Matthew, but when Eusebius discusses it in explicit detail, he doesn't talk about the Gospel of Matthew. He talks about the Gospel according to the Hebrews. And he talks about a story that is today, uh, looks like it's found in our current Gospel of John. So it's, it's, it's a scrambled up jigsaw puzzle. I, I don't know what the heck Papias is talking about. Uh, but Richard Balcom just jumps to these conclusions and he doesn't bring up, um, you know, these 
these these rabbit trails that, that really do need to be brought up. Because when you look at it in context, there's a whole lot more to this story than Richard Balcom is bringing up. Again, just red flags that jump out to me. So anyway, Papias, pardon me, Richard Balcom uh, uh, goes on. And he's going to talk about the, uh, the, the turkeys who took the pure gospel of Matthew uh, and... Uh, corrupted it with crappy translations and uh, you know and that's the, the and the result is the gospel of the Ebionites. So here's what Balcom has to say on page 224. Quite probably, Papius continued, after the sentence quoted by Eusebius, to make it more explicit that the original order given to his work by the eyewitness Matthew, <laughs> again the eyewitness, <laughs> had suffered in translation. Unlike Mark's scrupulosity in translating and recording no more or less than Peter said, the translators of Matthew had made major alterations to the Apostles' text. Eusebius would not have approved of such a view and would have censored anything more that Papias said about it. That's awesome. So now, <laughs> so now, um, uh, Eusebius is editing out material because, um, not because it's an editorial decision, but because uh, he wants to uh, suppress uh, needed information. That's, that's, uh, that's awesome. So, I think from here Richard Balcom's got a real problem. Again, he's, gonna, he's, going, to, I'm, uh, he's going to argue out of both sides of his mouth. And this is something that I talked about in the last video a little bit. But... In this case, it has to do with Balcom's translation of the word uh, translate. Uh, Hermann Newson, uh, I, I believe, is the Greek. So, Bar Balcom has been arguing throughout this book that Mark translates the Logia of, of the Apostle Peter very accurately. He puts Mark on this crazy high standard. He's, you know strict historiography. Mark just is, you know, the best. He doesn't leave anything out. In fact, Mark leaves his material out of order. Why? Because the evangelist Mark was apparently too scrupulous a, a translator that he didn't even dare put it in order because he was not actually an eyewitness himself. He just took the anecdotes of the Apostle Peter down as Peter spoke them. And he just scribbled them down and he put them into his gospel in the order that Peter said, I guess. Uh, and, and he didn't dare put them in order because he was not an eyewitness. Well, listen, when the same Greek word for translate, Hermann Newson, when it's used of people that supposedly took the accurate, orderly words of Matthew and put them out of order. So that's the re the result of that is our gospels of of uh, the Ebionites and the gospel you know the all these other gospels that are in the Matthean family. According to Balcom, they translated but put them out of order. Um, now <laughs> Richard Balcom now has to argue that the Greek word Hermeneusen, in fact does not mean strict translation, but that now translated texts were commonly translated with heavy alterations to the text. Um, you know, and, and Balcom cites uh, examples from Josephus and some others, etc. Et so when Balcom is discussing the translation of the evangelist Mark, He's got one standard. When he's talking about the translations of, of uh, other people, he's got a different standard. And that's why, again, that's why it's so confusing to read this book, in particular, this chapter. It's like all of these, um, uh, these competing positions that Richard Balcom is making are kind of converging together now at this point. We're far enough in this book that these arguments that all Richard Balcom, are, he's trying to tie them all together now and there are so many opposing positions that he's had, it's coming to a head. And it's making it very confusing for me uh, to understand what the heck he's talking about. So, that's, you know, 
actually, Papias talks about what we assume to be our Gospel of Matthew for one lousy sentence. So there's really only so much you can say about it. Um, so now uh, Richard Balcom is going to crowbar the Gospel of John in there somehow. So here's how he starts. Well, we've already talked about how he starts. So he's going to continue that discussion on page 225. Here's, here's what he says. If, as we have argued, the kind of literary order Papias missed in uh, Mark was primarily chronological, then Matthew could not have seemed much evident of an improvement on Mark, since it largely follows the same sequence of brief narratives. If we take seriously the implication that the order originally given to his uh, Pap that is Papias's gospel by Matthew was spoiled by the translators, then it becomes much more plausible to suppose that Papias is comparing the lack of order in both Mark and Matthew with the presence of order in another gospel, that of John. <laughs> so out of thin air... <laughs> You got the Gospel of John. <laughs> That's how it works, folks. Well, <laughs> well, you know, look, let's go back again. It's one lousy sentence. What does Papias have to say about the Gospel of Matthew? Matthew put the Logia in an ordered arrangement. Say it with me. An ordered arrangement. So somehow, in order to shoehorn... <laughs> the Gospel of John in there, he's got to argue that, well, yeah, okay, Papias said that it was put in an orderly arrangement, but that's not really what Papias meant. He meant to say that the uh, Gospel of Matthew was actually out of an orderly arrangement. It's really the crappy translations from the original uh, uh, Gospel of Matthew uh, direct from the eyewitness's lips. Well, it's actually out of order. And because of that, well, you know, Papias must be comparing these two out of order gospels, Matthew and Mark, to another one. It's unmentioned, it's unnamed. Uh, Papias did talk about the gospel according to the Hebrews. Uh, no, 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 let's, let's ignore that. He must have been talking about the gospel of John. Out of thin air, folks. Out of thin air, I tell you. Let's continue with what Richard Balcom has to say on page 225. The only reason Papias could have had for thinking that the Gospels of Matthew and Mark both lacked the kind of order to be expected in a work deriving from an eyewitness is that he knew another Gospel, <laughs> also of eyewitness origin whose chronological sequence differed significantly from Mark's and Matthew's, and whose order Papias preferred. Uh, Balcom continues on page 227, but since in Papias's comment on Mark, he makes it clear that only an eyewitness could be a reliable source of the kind of order Papias expected in a gospel, he could not have thought his own work, that is, Papias's expositions of the oracles of the Lord, he could not have expected that this provided this kind of order unless he derived the order itself from an eyewitness source. Ah, Richard Balka, I tell you. Okay, look, I talked about this again in the last video. I'm going to repeat it here. I don't know what the hell Balka is talking about. I, in, in one sentence, Richard Balcom says that the evangelist Mark did not dare put his material in order. Why? Because he was not an eyewitness. He had the uh, apostle Peter right there. They, they were traveling companions, apparently, or, you know, they knew each other and... Uh, the evangelist Mark translated the very words of Peter to make his gospel, but he was so scrupulously accurate that he left it out of order because he is not himself an eyewitness. 
But in the same sentence, in the same sentence, Richard Baucom says that Papias, in his work, could put this stuff in order. And how could he do it? Because he got that order from a second source, a secondary source, an eyewitness source. Papias was not an, an eyewitness. We have to argue that he was a scrupulous historian too, but we also have to argue that he could put his stuff in order. Okay, he could do it because he knew John, but Mark could not do it even though he knew Peter. In the same sentence, Richard Balcom does this. He's talking out of both sides of his mouth. I'm confused. Is, is Papias talking about what we now today consider our canonical Gospel of Matthew? See, because I thought Papias said that this was in order. But, Pap but Balcom is saying it's out of order because it, it's, its order is so similar to that of Mark. Whatever. <laughs> All right. Uh, you know, <laughs> let's... let's I'm not going to talk about the Gospel of Matthew anymore. Let's 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 talk about the what else uh, Richard Balcom can cram into the papia scap. <laughs> so Balcom continues on page 228. Matthew's Gospel. <clears throat> pardon me. I, I, I got to stop getting excited. I tell you, it's getting it's it's too dry here and too hot here in El Paso, Texas. I'm getting dehydrated. Okay, uh, got to calm down a little bit. Okay, um, on page 228, uh, Richard Balcom says, Matthew's Gospel, in the Greek form that Papias knew, also, when similarly set against the standard of John's Gospel, lacked order. But the reason for this was different. The original Hebrew or Aramaic work written by the eyewitness Matthew himself must have <laughs> my heart rate's already going up must have had the accurate order Matthew would have been able to give it but Papias thought this order had been disrupted by those who exercised considerable freedom in their rendering of the gospel in Greek these evaluations of the gospels of Mark and Matthew make excellent sense once we realize that Papias valued above all the Gospel of John, which was directly written by an eyewitness and offered a much more precise chronological sequence of events. Remember, people, remember, Papias never, ever mentions the Gospel of John. All of a sudden, Richard Balcom is saying that it is the one gospel that Papias preferred above all others. Out of thin air. Out of thin air. And again, saying that Matthew is the eyewitness source of, of his own gospel. Let's just ignore the first eight chapters of this book where Balcom explicitly says that the apostle Matthew could not have been the author. Let's just forget about that out of thin air, we make him the eyewitness source. And we'll leave it at that. Um, Richard Balcom helpfully uh, outlines what he thinks Papias said about each gospel. Um, the gospel of Mark, the gospel of Matthew, and uh, the gospel of John. <laughs> so um, he, uh, he, he helpfully says that Papias uh, says that uh, John was an eyewitness. Uh, he puts the Logia about Jesus uh, in Greek in uh, some kind of literary order and compares it to what uh, Papias also sa has to say about Mark and Matthew. So I'll, I'll leave that uh, organization here on this slide. Uh, so it's amazing how uh, uh, Richard Balcom can... Um, pull this, uh, this organization of what Papias said about the Gospel of John uh, when, um, you know, I, when he never even discusses it. That's really something. And again, I don't, I don't mind speculation, but um, I guess the difference is that he's, he's, he's using this as evidence that 
the Gospels are based on eyewitness testimony. And he's speculating or he's inventing uh, the existence of evidence. He's creating evidence out of thin air to bolster his argument, his overall thesis that, you know, the Gospels are based actually on eyewitness testimony. Uh, look, the, the evidence he's creating is just invented out of thin air, particularly, you know, like the existence of, of Papias talking about the Gospel of John. He's using that as evidence that it's based on eyewitness testimony. Look, you know, I mean, that, that's just invented evidence. That's really something. Well, I, you know, I want to be fair to Richard Balcom. He, he does invent uh, evidence, you know, what's, you know, what's inside the Papias gap. You know, he, doesn't, he does say that Papias talks about the Gospel of John. But he also says that it's undoubtedly true that Papias did know the Gospel of John. And he's got evidence for it. And I didn't put this on a slide. I'll just read it here. Uh, on page 225, Balcom says, There should be no doubt that Papias knew John's gospel. Um, so let's look at his evidence. He, he, uh, he, goes, he has a whole paragraph here with evidence that Papias did, in fact, know the gospel of John. He didn't pull it out of his rear. Let's check out his evidence. His evidence is that Papias lists the names of some of the disciples of Jesus and puts them in a uh, particular order that, according to Richard Balcom, is the same order as that found in the Gospel of John. Oh, great. So we can compare. So Richard Balcom helpfully lists down the names of um, that are, I guess are found in the Gospel of John. He lists uh, Andrew, Peter, Philip, Thomas, James, and John. Okay, so I went through Papias and I listed down the names of disciples as they are listed by Papias. And uh, I only included the, um, I guess I'll call them the traditional 12 disciples of Jesus. I only pulled names out of that. So Papias has, and in order of appearance, Andrew, Peter, Philip, Thomas, James, John, and Matthew. Now, Richard Balcom, his evidence is apparently that Papias needed a list of names of disciples um, and so he got his information by consulting, uh, the gospel of John and, you know, he found a list of names in there and he wrote them down in the order that he found them in the gospel of John. Well, you know, first thing right now, I mean, I, so I listed down the names that I found in Papias, the names of disciples that, you know, they're the traditional 12 disciples. These are the names that I found and I compared them with the names that are listed in John's gospel. Now, again, Richard Balcom says Andrew, Peter, Philip, Thomas, James, and John. Well, first red flag, James and John are not mentioned in John's gospel. They are called the sons of Zebedee in John's gospel. Small point. It's it's understood in all the other Gospels that, yeah, that's James and John. But, I mean, look, if Papias is consulting uh, John's Gospel for a list of names and he sees sons of Zebedee, okay, right there, we have to make the assumption that Papias saw sons of Zebedee and uh, in John's Gospel and turned it into um, James and John. Okay, there's the first jump we have to make. Second jump is that uh, there are, is the existence of uh, the disciple Matthew in Papias. Now, wait a minute. I don't see uh, Matthew in John's gospel. So if Papias is consulting John's gospel, why did he include Matthew? Well, you know, Richard Balcom helpfully uh, uh, makes us understand that. He says that 
uh, he wishes to include the disciple Matthew on account of uh, his importance because he's an author of another gospel. Well, there you go. Uh, so there are exceptions to this line of reasoning, but Richard Balcom can uh, can use apologetic reasoning to uh, to explain those discrepancies. So yeah, Papias consulted the Gospel of John, included Matthew in there, but he did that because obviously Matthew's super important. He was a eyewitness. Oh, there you go. So we got two jumps. First, uh, Papias changed sons of Zebedee to James and John. He included Matthew because he's an important eyewitness. Um, well, okay, so what else can we uh, discover? Let's go through the um, Gospel of John and Papias and get a little bit more of a fuller idea of what disciples are listed. So I went and did that. And I got a little bit of a more full picture, I think. So Papias does include, in order of appearance, uh, the, uh, the names I just mentioned. But he also includes Aristion and the Presbyter John. Um, you know, where did he get these names from? Um, I don't know. And, you know, who's the Presbyter John? Well... We'll talk about that later, I guess. Um, um, but he's not in the John's Gospel. It's somebody. These are two characters who are not named in John's Gospel. That's kind of the bottom line of this discussion. Where did these names come from that Papias also used? I don't know. But nonetheless, uh, in, and, and Balcom does not bring this up. This is just something that I'm bringing up just to be a stick in the mud. Um, it's, it's an exception uh, to the argument that Richard Balcom is making. Let's go through John's gospel now. Let's let's go through John's gospel. Um, Balcom's missing a couple of names in here. First one is Nathaniel. Uh, Papias never mentions Nathaniel. Now, what the heck? Why is this? Well, Balcom also helpfully makes us understand this. Nathaniel is not included by Papias because Papias wants to keep his list of names to the symbolic number of seven. So, hmm, okay, so actually I see nine names listed uh, by Papias, but, you know, if we're just going to use the traditional uh, disciples of Jesus, okay, we'll say that there's seven, Andrew, Peter, Philip, Thomas, James, John, and Matthew. Okay, so now we're to uh, another step. So uh, James and John, he can, okay. So Papias consulted John's gospel for a list of names. He saw sons of Zebedee, turned that into James and John. He rejected Nathaniel because in doing so, it would keep the traditional number or the symbolic number of seven, uh, if he included the important name of Matthew, because Matthew is an eyewitness. So we've already got an awful lot of exceptions here to this argument that Richard Balcom is trying to cook up. A couple of other things here that I thought were interesting. Um, uh, John lists a couple of other disciples that Richard Balcom uh, never mentions. Uh, the first one is uh, Judas Iscariot. Uh, <laughs> I mean, understandably, I can understand Papias doesn't want to include him in a list of uh, of, of, of disciples. Um, never mind the fact that John's Gospel mentions Judas Iscariot probably more than any other disciple of Jesus. Um, there is also the disciple that Jesus loved. Uh, he's found in John's Gospel. Um, what about him? Um, well, Papias, if he can interpret to us who the sons of Zebedee are, as James and John, wow, that would have been awesome if he would have had interpreted to us who the disciple whom Jesus loved was. He could have said that was the presbyter John, but he, you know, that would have been incredible, but leaves that name out. Um, what about Judas not Iscariot? Judas not Iscariot is a disciple 
of Jesus, and he is listed in the Gospel of John. Um, but it's ignored by Richard Balcom. So I'm finding exceptions to this line of reasoning that Richard Balcom is saying, that Papias opened up the Gospel of John for a list of names, and he found this order of names in there, and he, and he got them. I'm, I'm finding an awful lot of exceptions that, again, just raise red flags. That's Richard Balcom's pretty much his only argument. He also says there is an Armenian reference to Papias, which seems to depend on a comment uh, that is made on John chapter 19, verse 39. Uh, he doesn't really comment on that. Um, Balcom says that Irenaeus in Against Heresies uh, talks about um, or has a, a citation that talks about uh, um, in, in, uh, in heaven there's a, in, or in paradise there's many mansions and um, that shares a commonality with the Gospel of John and um, you know that may have come from Papias. There's, there's actually no hint in Irenaeus that that did come from Papias but Balcom brings that up and that's it. That's it. So Balcom says he has positive evidence. This is what he brings up. So his main argument is this, this uh, list of names, this list of disciples that he says came from the Gospel of John. I'm finding an awful lot of uh, exceptions to this list of names that he brings up. And then just really, um, you know, not as secure evidence, something found from Irenaeus and some Ir uh, Armenian reference that Balcom really doesn't develop. He says that there's not much to that. And that's it. That's the best he's got. <clears throat> so there you go. Uh, <laughs> now there, um, there is more to chapter 9. Uh, I, I, again, I apologize. I, I feel like this was a very confusing discussion because it went off in a lot of of, of, of side tracks and there's a lot of conf um, evidence or, or reasoning that Balcom uses that conf that that contradicts one another so I, I apologize this was a confusing uh, discussion reading Balcom particularly this chapter has been confusing so um, there are a few more pages Richard Balcom wants to talk about um, a little bit more about Justin Martyr. I guess tying up some loose ends. He wants to talk some more about is the Gospel of Mark. What what exactly does that ordering mean? I think I've discussed that enough. Um, so right about here, I am almost exactly halfway. <laughs> <laughs> halfway through Richard Balcom's book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. So I've gone through nine chapters. Uh, chapter 10 is where I'm going to be really out of my comfort zone. Chapter 10 is going to begin a discussion on memory and story transmission and uh, oral tradition and things like that. Uh, it's going to be a lot of, um, you know, psychology, a lot of, um, uh, you know, discussions from folklorists, how stories are preserved, how they're transmitted, things like that. Um, I have not, from here on, I have not read. It looks like there's yet another chapter on Papias. <laughs> it's like, how many, he's really hanging a lot on Papias, I tell you. But a lot of this has to do with memory from here on. And uh, hey, I know what you're thinking. You think I'm gonna? You think I'm gonna bail? Don't you? You think I'm gonna bail on this book? Oh no, <laughs> I'm not bailing. I'm gonna continue. Uh, I have not read from here on, uh, so I don't know what is in store for me. I know there was a uh, radio discussion with uh, Richard Balcom and uh, his arch nemesis Bart Ehrman talking about uh, memory and story transmission. I did not listen to it on purpose because. I'm going through this. I'm. This book has been really preposterous to me so far. I found a lot of faulty reasoning on the part of Richard Balcom, and I've tried to outline it as best as I can. 
as best as I am able, considering I'm just an amateur and this is a hobby. This is something I do in spare time. But I've tried to do this in a way that is understandable. I'm just, I'm not so much presenting counter arguments to uh, Richard Balcom. You know, he's saying that that uh you know the the gospel of mark is early hey i've got evidence that the gospel of mark is actually written later i'm trying not to do that i'm trying just to stick to balcom's reasoning as a matter of fact just to remind everybody i have followed the uh the, i have followed my uh, my promise that i am not assuming that uh the gospels are historically unreliable i'm i'm approaching this as somebody who think who is who's i'm arguing from the position that the gospels are historically reliable and i have not deviated from that in this entire discussion nine chapters in i'm still arguing from that position just to focus on the reasoning of richard balcom so i'm I, I'm really trying hard to look at only his reasoning. And uh, so there you go. I'm going to continue with, uh, with uh, that method as we go. So I have to go through chapter 10 first, and I, and I have to do some, some side reading, I think. So it may be a little while before I get to uh, my next discussion on chapter 10. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. So anyway, um, until then, take care.